want to talk about surgery. When is that indicated? And then we'll go on to fecal transplants because everybody was really excited about that. Still are, actually. Well, it's interesting that we go from the most expensive to the least expensive. Beslo, the most expensive, perhaps. Fecal transplant, the least expensive. Okay. Because we all have the drug and we deposit it in the toilet every day. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe every day. So uh, fecal tra I'd like to start with fecal transplant. Uh, I did my first fecal transplant in 1990. Uh, and uh, now it's, uh, it's sort of caught on as a, uh, almost like a wonder drug. Uh, and what's interesting about it uh, is that the cure rates for patients with recurrent disease, and that's when we can use it. Uh, it is not an FDA-approved drug, but the FDA will allow you to use it for patients who are... Uh, having their third recurrence of disease or a recurrence that is particularly severe and wound up uh, necessitating the hospitalization, or in a patient who is very severely, almost deathly ill in their index episode. And we've treated several patients uh, in the latter group. The cure rates, well, let me say how it works first. One of the things that we've been talking about is in recurrent disease, is the reason the disease is probably recurrent is because that patient with recurrent disease doesn't have the normally rich, diverse communities of bacteria that uh, normal patients uh, have, patients without recurrency diff. And with fecal transplant, you can immediately restore the normality of the community and therefore re-give the patient that colonization resistance, their ability to prevent the C. diff colonies from, you know, uh, establishing uh, themselves again. Well, having said that, it becomes even more complicated because there recently was a publication uh, that showed that you don't have to have the live bacteria there. You can sterile filter the, uh, the stool uh, so that now it's culture negative. Now, we don't get all the bugs and we culture stool. We only get about 5 to 20 percent of the bugs. But essentially, it's a sterile uh, mixture now. It still worked. So that brings us back to uh, the point that Eric made, which is maybe it's not the bugs themselves. Maybe it's the uh, metabolic products of the bugs. Maybe it's the way that they metabolize uh, bile salts and raise the concentration of secondary bile salts, which inhibit the, uh, the growth of the C. diff. Well, having said that, mechanism aside, when do we use it? We use it for recurrence or in patients who are severely ill. What kind of results can we expect? If you infuse the stool uh, into the cecum colonoscopically, you'll get about a 91 to 93 percent recurrence rate, uh, cure rate, cure rate. If you do it endoscopically and put a smaller volume, higher concentration, into the duodenum, you'll get about an 84 percent rate. If you only put it in by enema a short distance, you'll get about an 84 percent recurrence rate. If you give patients fecal capsules, so these are now, uh, these are made by a, uh, a, a stool banking company, uh, and uh, they're stool capsules, and they're frozen. They'll, uh, they're then shipped to you frozen. You defrost them, and you give them to patients. Uh, the dose is uh, 25 capsules uh, taken over whatever period of time you need to take that, half an hour to two hours, three hours, four hours. Uh, and that will give you somewhere around, oh, perhaps a 75% uh, uh, cure rate. And if you took it two days in a row, 25 capsules, 25 capsules, you can bump that up to about 79, perhaps 80 percent. Here we may see some differences between us, infectious disease in the, on the panel, and, and gastroenterologists. Uh, well, stool transplants work very, very well in a very select group of patients. There's no question about, uh, about that. You know, one of the problems with stool transplants is it's not scalable. 
and, and it's potentially problematic. You know, we think the world is in the biome, and the biome, bed biome can be associated with inflammatory bowel disease and so many things, and we never know what we really transfer to our patient. I also want to uh, say, it, it's, while it's a tr an attractive approach to, to identify those bacteria that matter and put them in capsules, the two companies that are more advanced with that, most advanced with that, who just completed their phase two trials, both companies completely failed with uh, the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, and so while this may be a, um, a futuristic approach to preventing multiple recurrences, um, I think that we are not there uh, as, as if I can just I, I have to have this I have to just one, but just one the, 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 to complement to or to complete the ID the ID physicians approach um, I think that what we are trying to do and and while I agree that the, the, when we are desperate you know stool transplants may work very well what we are trying to do is we try to improve our practice so that we don't get into these multiple recurrences uh, state so that fewer patients will actually get to a, a, a state in which they have multiple recurrences. This side of the table was about to explode. Well, I'll give I, you your shot. No, I actually just had a question for Larry. So my experience has been very similar to yours, that with well-selected patients with multiple recurrences, uh, FMT works uh, tremendously well. But my experience for inpatients uh, has been a little bit different. And when I've been called to be involved with a critically ill patient to do an FMT, uh, I haven't had as much success. Now, I don't know if I'm being called too late in the game, uh, and I wonder if you could tell me about your experience there, what it's been like. So n now we come with the, uh, my severe disagreement with you, I'm gonna pass on for the moment here, right. okay? But my, um, now we're sorta flirting with a patient who, do we call the surgeon to take out the colon, or part of the colon, or whatever surgical approach we wanna use to this, because sometimes you don't have to take out the colon. You can just do an ostomy, an ileostomy, and do a prograde lavage with vancomycin and save the colon, right? But in that terribly sick patient with uh, severe disease, toxic megacolon, one can do fecal transplant. And I've done about half a dozen myself in patients with toxic megacolon, and they've all gotten better. And sometimes you can see the betterment, if you will, within an hour. I have seen patients with terribly high fevers, uh, big belly, uh, white count uh, in the uh, 50 to 100,000 range, leukemoid reaction, and three hours after the fecal transplant, the belly is already down, they're less tender, they're now more awake, their white count is dropping, yeah? It's only a couple of cases that have done that. Yeah, I mean, my, my own anecdotal experience with IVIG is very similar, where very rapid improvement with a single dose, high dose. I go with a 500 milligram per kilogram dose. If there's someone I'm seeing that I think might need surgery, I try to do that first. And, and again, just in my mind, it's it, in, in every patient that I've been able to do that, quickly enough to, I think I've been able to avoid a colectomy. So. I think actually one very great overall point to make here is that in that kind of very sick patient that we're talking about, this is really a multidisciplinary patient. Early on, you should get involved, your infectious disease specialist, your gastroenterologist, your colorectal surgeon, not when it's too late, mm -hmm. but consider these options, IVIG, fecal transplant, loop ileostomy, that have pretty good success rates. Consider them early, and you know, you're gonna have a better time persuading your surgeon to do that if that's what's needed with uh, a paper by Camerata, an Italian paper, in which uh, they were administering fecal transplants by colonoscopy. The first two patients that they did, both had pseudomembranes seen at colonoscopy. They did the fecal transplant. Neither one of them did well. And, and in fact, both of them died. They were put on vancomycin. Well, th thank and, you, you've and, made me feel better about and, my own personal and, experience and, with and C. diff in the ICU. After that, whenever they saw pseudomembranes at colonoscopy, they went back three days later and did another fecal transplant and they repeated it until the patient got better. Right. Well, and, I think what, what- Is that something you've seen? Yes. Have you seen pseudomembranes? Yes. So, so what you're saying now is that um, you sort of, uh, uh, speaking about a change in the technique. Uh, rather than do one fecal transplant, do several. Let's think of it in terms of a three-day approach. Not going in very far, because these patients, to do a colonoscopy on them can be frightfully dangerous. But go in as, uh, as far as you feel 
comfortable going in. It may only be a foot or a foot and a half. Put in a volume of stool and come out. And then the next day, do the same thing, and the next day do the same thing. And during that time, also give the vancomycin. So I think that in the United States, we're starting to evolve towards that kind of an approach.